Welcome. We're so happy to have you here. One of the great things about SOCAP is that we don't have to introduce you to each other. You seem to be ready to go, go to work talking to each other the second you get here. I'm Rosalie Harden, I'm the producer of SOCAP, and I am here to give a very brief welcome and a little bit of, of details about where you can find things. And there are two things that you need to know that will be the most helpful for you, and one is how to find a volunteer who can help you if you don't know where something is. And so I'd like for all of the green-shirted people to wave at you right now. Could all the volunteers give a big wave? We have a stand up, wave, get up, stand up and wave. Those are the people who are here to help you find your way around. And Michael, can you stand up and show your blue badge? The people who are wearing blue badges are on staff and they are ready and willing to help you as well. Thank you. I know you found the food because we had to work real hard to get you to come over here and leave the food. That's always a great thing with Acre Gourmet here at SOCAP and we're thrilled to have them back with us again this year. Yesterday we had about 400 people, 300, 400 people in our newcomer session and they're all ready to get to know you, the folks who have been here many years before. So please look around for strangers, people you have not met before. They may be the most valuable person for you to know at this event. And with no further ado, we are going to get started. And my husband and co-founder of SOCAP, Kevin Jones, is going to come and talk to you about what's happening with this year's Igniting Vibrant Communities. Kevin. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to SOCAP. This is our largest conference, 2,500 people when we were 1,900 uh, last year. And 40% of you have never been to SOCAP and we've done no outbound communication to you. People have found us, there's something happening here. So those numbers are amazing for a conference in its eighth, eighth year, but that says something is happening, that more people are starting to get the idea that there is a market at the intersection of money and meaning, the space between giving and investing. Now, we're also validated this year by having people that speak that we've been asking to come for seven years. People like Sir Ronald Cohen, the father of British venture capital and social investing in the UK. And until yesterday, we had Raj Shah, the head of USAID, but now he's flying to Liberia because of Ebola. So we have a lot of AID folks, but apparently Ebola takes precedence, so I can see that. But they have a huge announcement that really changes things. Uh, that makes things different. They're subsidizing the management fees of small funds. That sounds like a technical detail, but it means it makes early stage investing far easier. You can have a small fund and actually have it work. That could solve the problem of what's called the valley of death. That's the gap where promising accelerator startups hit a wall before they get a track record to justify traditional venture financing. That's indicative of something really far larger. Its important infrastructure is coming online that fills important gaps in the market that lets you put your heart into your investments and get your money back. Markets go through three stages. They go from discovery where you figure some things out and you have to figure out who's doing what. And then there's the second phase of a market where it's cooperation, one-off things where train tracks. And then finally the third stage where train tracks are interoperable and financial exchanges work. We're in the third stage of this market but it's in the early stages. I'm gonna use an analogy from American innovation to point out what that is like. We're at the stages of this social capital market, this impact investing social enterprise market, <clears throat> where in the US, regional railroads were cropping up and they opened up markets. It was really good news, but there was no coordination between the rail lines. So at each rail system, they would have to offload everything, sometimes put it on carts and take it to the next railroad system until they got to the stage where they agreed on the gauges between the railroads. What we're having now is a lot of innovation and infrastructure cropping up, but there's no interoperability much. What AID does is it bridges the railroads. So the widths of the track are being equalized and standardized. Like AID is a crucial bridge between the railroads. It eliminates a huge friction with that vital connection. So we're connecting the railroads, the pieces of infrastructure that are cropping up. That's a really good sign in a market. And it's in that light that we're also excited to continue exploring our partnership with Sandkelp, 
<clears throat> they're the group from India that puts on the largest social enterprise uh, impact in investor conferences in the global south, in India and in sub-Saharan Africa. And we're beginning to come to agree stages of our railroads, what we call it, what they call it, what works in India, what works in Kenya, what works in the U.S., and what we can learn from each other. A north-south global learning partnership, our, another piece of the infrastructure that's coming online as we move into the coordination phase, the third stage, the maturation stage of this market at the intersection of money and meaning. Another important railroad linking coming up is professional education. There's been enough research now that we know what a good impact investor does and what bad ones don't do. And we hope to partner with Kathy Clark of Case at Duke and ICAP Partners, Ben Thornley's new startup, to bring professional education to funds, to financial service companies, to the payment providers, to the investment banks who are putting new staffers into this new space looking at financial inclusion and trying to figure out what's different about this finance than other kinds of finance. They need to learn. Wall Street folks don't really get it. They need to learn, wherever they're from. So SOCAP was built and owes its growth to focusing intentionally on bringing in the valuable stranger, the unlikely ally. In that light, we have some new valuable strangers in the room here. We have sessions with indigenous investors and entrepreneurs where we're going to explore how to use risk capital in a non-extractive way that's consonant with indigenous values. I think we can do that. We're, we've been in conversation for a while. There's some of those conversations will be really interesting at this conference. And we're going to talk with an African-American activist and historian about how social enterprise can help a place like Ferguson, Missouri. One of the valuable strangers that is here in force this year are what would have been an unlikely ally just a few years ago are the corporates, specifically the financial service companies like American Express and a lot of other financial service companies and investment banks. And the good news is that we don't just have the CSR folks this year, the public affairs funded folks. They have real revenue targets in financial inclusion here in the U.S. That's making money, reducing the cost of being poor. That's not making money off the poor, but reducing the cost of being poor, the, the cost of payday lending and other kinds of things where the poor are victimized. Thanks to smartphones and big data, Financial inclusion is one of those sweet spots where the market and justice overlap. Those don't come along all the time. We have some things around Obamacare and M Health, where the working poor are actually the most valuable customers in the American health care system. And we're going to be looking at those places where the market and justice overlap, and we'll be looking at places where there's still a cost of doing good, where the market doesn't always overlap, and you have to subsidize or have some reduced return. We're a blended value market. We, you can do well and do good. Sometimes there's a cost. Sometimes we work with government. Sometimes we work with nonprofits. And we're figuring out how to do all those things and partner much bigger and much more coherently than we've done in the past. It's building the bridges between the railroads and making the gauges standard, just like we did when we made the railroad system work. We have more than 100 sessions where you can learn and meet your peers and potential partners here at SOCAP. But if you're going to some session and you find it interesting, look at the list of attendees. The, it could be that the, and if you look at their profiles, you can find that the experts are actually sitting next to you and not up on stage. Pay attention to the people that you're in line with at lunch or coffee. Look for the unlikely allies and the valuable strangers that you can find at SOCAP. The power is in the crowd. The power is in the community. We're glad to convene it. I think we have a lot of great content, but also listen to each other. So thank you for coming. This is the biggest crowd we've had, and welcome to SOCAP. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Kevin is staying here on the stage, and he is going to be joined by uh, the board chair of Mission Hub, which is the parent company of SOCAP, and by Tim Freundlich, who's the board president of Mission Hub and uh, SOCAP for a special presentation about the founding of SOCAP. Kevin, if you'll come back. Right. Thank you. So <clears throat> I'm happy to honor Harry Halloran, who was our first sponsor. In fact, the sponsor that allowed SOCAP to become a reality. He put up the money that allowed SOCAP to become a reality when our sponsor proposal was just in a Word doc. It wasn't even baked enough to be in a PDF. And the title, Social Capital Markets, had a little parenthesis after it that said, Working Title. Uh, 
when we, but when we said there needs to be a big tent convening, not another siloed, fragmented convening where you try to get, quote, the right people in the room, which frustrated everybody, he got it. Uh, nobody else was getting it. Harry got it. And it was this intuitive way that he got it when nobody else did that, co- that allowed us to hire our two, first two staffers eight and a half years ago to make this thing a reality. Now, if Harry had used the MBA-type market analysis thinking, he wouldn't have done it because the accepted wisdom was that <laughs> you needed the right people in the room. But he used his intuitive gut instinct of the successful entrepreneur that he is, and he caused this thing to happen. Uh, it, it's the instinct to skate where the puck is going to be and also to not listen to the people that say the puck is not going there. Harry has this intuitive way, early gut-thinking entrepreneur, that caused this to be a reality. And that's what's caused Halloran Philanthropies to be the intuitive early stage investor in funding things that other people might not look at, other people might not think make sense. But Harry and Halloran Philanthropies caused that to happen. So Harry, thank you. This, this wouldn't have happened without you taking a chance on somebody who had a proposal that was not even baked enough to be in a PDF. <laughs> so, so Thank you for come up. Give Harry a big hand <laughs> yeah. round of applause. <laughs> Harry. Can you stand up. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, I Harry. get to hug you. And I get to give you Thanks, man. It's a so cap, right? Pretty clever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also actually have so caps for Mark and, <coughs> and Tony, if you would like to please take these with my appreciation. They're actually monogrammed, just so everybody can see. <laughs> Harry, do you want, have anything you'd like to share briefly before we roll you off stage for the next event? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you know, the operable word is brief. Uh, But I want to tell you the real story. It was a little different than what Kevin said. Uh, Kevin interpreted my actions as if it was an intelligent, well-thought-out, entrepreneurial thing. Well, the real truth is, and I'd like Tony and Mark to come up here beside me while I tell the real story of how SOCAP got funded. So Mark Beam... (coughs) Mark is one of the founders, too, and Tony. And uh, so what really happened was that Mark and Tony said, you know, Harry, there's this really cool thing happening. It's called SOCAP. And uh, I said, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, What's it all about? Well, we're going to be getting hopefully three or 400 people here, and and we're going to have interface. Uh, It's different than than the Skull Forum in London, you know. It's really going to be exciting, and we're looking for sponsors. And they have platinum sponsors, and they have gold sponsors, and they're trying to get quite a few platinum sponsors, and uh, we would like you to be the platinum sponsor. So I said, wow, how much is that going to cost? What was it? 100000 100000 Yeah, I thought it was more than that. No. 100000 All right. <laughs> So for only 100000 then, then I found out that uh, we were the only platinum sponsor. I said, Tony, you didn't tell me. I thought the Rockefeller, I mean, you know, people with real money. I mean, a lot more money than we have. And um, they didn't become a platinum sponsor. I don't know where they, they are now. At all. Well, they are now. Good. Well, that's good. So, so anyway, it was, it's been... It's just wow, right, that it started very humbly. The timing, uh, in a way, couldn't have been, on the one hand, worse. At the start of the the, the recession was just collapsing. And, you know, the work uh, of the the founders really made this all happen. So, again, a, a little bit of applause again for Kevin and Rosa and for your... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Anyway, so the best thing is uh, to say is, wow, this is, you know, a dream come true. It was uh, articulated 
as something that might happen and grow. And it's grown from five or six hundred people, I think, was the mm -hmm. first one. They th were trying for three or four hundred. They got five or six hundred. It was an indication it was going to grow now to 2,500. So thanks for the recognition, folks. And, uh, great. Very Thank you. <laughs> thanks. That's great. Yeah. You always have to tell the truth. It's now my pleasure to introduce Judith Roden, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation and former president of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Judith is also, I asked Judith this morning if she could share something uh, fun from her recent or current life, things she's been working on, and she said, well, of course, there's my new book. So I want to mention that co-authored with Margot Brandenburg, um, Judith has just completed a new book called The Power of Impact Investing. The Rockefeller Foundation has been a wonderful partner as well to us here at SOCAP, and as many of us know, particularly those of us who are branded with the word pioneer, which means basically we're very old, um, that the Rockefeller Foundation has been very much part of building the impact investing field. So I'm greatly uh, delighted, really, to bring Judith back this year for uh, a, a talk on our stage. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be back at SOCAP. I last spoke here in 2012. Many of you remember I said that the Rockefeller Foundation was preparing for its centennial year at that time. Now it's 2014, we're just recovering from our centennial year. At 101 years old, we're not maybe quite old enough to remember the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, but our founder, John D. Rockefeller, gave more than $100,000 to help the city get back on its feet. But it was another businessman who stepped up to save the city more profoundly. When E.H. Harriman, the president of the Southern Pacific Railroad, heard the news about the earthquake, he led the first train west to assess how the railroad might assist in the recovery. When he arrived in Oakland, he immediately ordered tracks to be laid down into the most devastated parts of town to carry out people and debris. He met with local officials to kickstart the rebuilding process and sent telegrams across the country pleading for both private and public funds. And he gave $200,000 of his own fortune directly to the cause. The rich and poor have to be cared for alike, he wrote in a telegram home. I begin with this story not only because it's relevant, obviously, to last week's earthquake, which serves as a reminder of the shocks and stresses we continue to face, but also, importantly, because it reflects the kind of spirit that brings each of us here today. The belief that we all share with Harriman and that his friend John Muir put best when he wrote that Harriman cared for money as a tool, like a locomotive or a ship. Indeed, private capital is a powerful tool for helping to solve humanity's greatest challenges which is critical because philanthropy and government simply only have billions between us. Yet private markets hold an estimated $210 trillion in capital, $80 trillion in pension and institutional funds alone. Seven years ago, a group of philanthropists and investors convened at the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center, where they coined the term impact investing. They began to build the field to unlock greater amounts of private capital to do public good. We at Rockefeller have invested nearly 50 million over the last seven years into building the architecture and the infrastructure for impact investing. The launching and incubating of, of GIN, the, one of the global networks that's been so important the development of reporting and performance standards like IRIS and GEARS. We've worked on trying to help align the policy environment, and we've been helping to develop an evidence base of what works and what does not. We've also invested millions of our own PRI dollars to pioneer new investment structures and financial models. And as you can see, it takes all these elements of that ecosystem in order for this to work. Of course, we haven't acted alone. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Omidyar Network are creatively using PRIs and other financial structures in very exciting new ways. 
new funds beginning with the early pioneering work of Bridges Ventures and old line pension funds such as TIA CREF are building greater opportunities for social and environmental impact in their investment funds. Financial institutions like J.P. Morgan Chase and Morgan Stanley have created impact investing units within their corporate structure, while Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Goldman Sachs have led on investing in and making the markets for social impact bonds. And under the hard work of the G8 Impact Investing Working Group under the leadership of Sir Ronald Cohen, with the U.S. team led by Matt Bannock, we will see an enormously important step to further systematize and globalize this movement. Thanks to all of these contributions and so many more, impact investing has surely moved from the margins to the mainstream. Here are a few pieces of notable empirical evidence. J.P. Morgan and Gin's most recent survey of 125 major impact fund managers showed more than $46 billion worth of impact investments under management, a 20% increase from 2013 to 14. 91% of those investors reported financial returns in line or above their expectations, and 99%, 99%, reported social or environmental impact above or in line with their expectations. At this summer's White House Roundtable on Impact Investing, more than $1.5 billion in new capital for impact investing was committed by a group of investors spanning corporations, banks, foundations, and individuals. The Omidyar Network, the McKnight Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and Prudential Financial among them. There is really tremendous progress in building out this ecosystem. All of you in this room who are involved should give yourselves a big round of applause for how far we've come. For me, this is that moment that field builders hope will come one day. The time when we can step back and see the field mature and come, on to, and come into its own. But just as innovation propelled the growth of impact investing a decade ago, we are going to need a continuing focus, I believe, on financial innovation if we're going to mobilize capital on the scale needed to stimulate markets for social purpose. Which brings me to the reason I'm here today, not just to applaud the successes we have had together that we have created, but to challenge us to look to the future. Because if there's anyone who can create the next big innovation in the social capital markets, it is the people in this room. Let me tell you how our innovative finance team at Rockefeller has been working and what we've been imagining. While continuing, we hope, to help develop the field of impact investing, we see two new opportunities, distinct opportunities, for expanding the tools for innovative finance. Innovations in the kinds of financial mechanisms that provide new investment opportunities, and innovations in new models that align actors in new ways that leverage each partner's unique strengths while meeting their respective risk return expectations and needs. We believe that the goals of the next wave of the social financing innovation movement are threefold. First, to bring in new sources of capital, often from new actors who are not already mobilizing capital for social or environmental purpose. Second, to increase the amount of the capital that's marked for those purposes from existing sources, from current investors. And third, deploy existing capital in more effective and impactful ways. Take, for example, the social impact bonds. The original innovation of the SIB was its straightforward value proposition for each of the actors involved. It offered governments a way to fund proven preventive services without putting their tax dollars at risk. It offered nonprofits running a successful evidence-based intervention a way of accessing new streams of revenue to scale their services and it provided funds and private investors with more investment opportunities. Since Rockefeller and others started funding Social Finance UK to develop this very seedling of an innovation, 
It has now been adopted in more than a dozen countries, and 19 states across the United States are in the process of either closing or exploring deals. In California, bonds have been launched focusing on recidivism, homelessness, and asthma. In many cases, including New York State's first SIB to reduce juvenile recidivism, we at the Rockefeller Foundation have been both an investor and a guarantor. But what has made the SIB such a breakthrough innovation has been its real capacity, its ability to be repositioned, to be repurposed, to fit different applications. For example, development impact bonds are almost identical to the structure of SIBs except instead of the local or the national government repaying the investors, it's development finance institutions along with international donors and foundations. These can be used in the developing world to aid in the prevention of disease or increase in food security, for example, where greater support for evidence-based interventions would surely improve outcomes. SIBs and their many offshoots are just one example of innovations in the kinds of financial mechanisms that will provide new investment opportunities. There are also new kinds of mechanisms developing for evolving these land-based structures to the plight of the world's oceans, which are incredibly underfunded, even relative to other co conservation and environmental efforts. More than 80% of fish stocks are at near or beyond exploitation, threatening both marine ecosystems and the vast numbers of people around the world who depend on them for food and for livelihoods. Eco Asset Management Partners, in a collaboration with Oceana and RARE, funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies and Rockefeller, has now proposed new financial mechanisms that could dramatically accelerate the sustainability of the world's fisheries. Here's just one example. A microfinance or medium enterprise route to market vehicle, which will finance improvements to processing and distribution all along the value chain, including packaging and interim storage, to increase the sourcing of sustainable seafood in developing countries. This innovative structure also gives small fishers themselves an ownership stake an extra incentive to use uh, sustainable practices, and it will help us achieve Rockefeller's goal of protecting ecosystems and building more inclusive economies. Those are some of the examples of new financial mechanisms, but we know there are so many others waiting to be developed. A second area we believe is really ripe for innovation is in the development and testing of new models for instruments that partner disparate interests or disparate actors to collaborate and share risk and increase leverage. One example is a new partnership that we and the Overseas Private Investment Corporation have created to increase e uh, impact investments for solving development challenges. Here, Rockefeller will be the flexible capital partner providing certain early stage risk capital that will allow OPIC to do certain high impact deals that their suite of investment products does not allow them to do now. In return, OPIC will bring to bear their expansive operational capacity and deal origination and conducting due diligence. The innovation we're piloting is whether this approach for structuring impact investing deals by deploying together risk capital from a philanthropy and a large source of capital from a DFI will attract and de-risk investment capital from commercial investors. This kind of model could then be applied to a wide variety of development challenges. But there are other models that are tailored to a more specific problem, and I'll give you one example. In India, we're doing work to reduce rural poverty which is exacerbated by the reality that large swaths of rural India are not yet connected to the electric grid and they will not be for a very, very long time. It is one of the major causes of significant rural poverty and you can see on this map the overlay of rural poverty and the lack of electrification. Through our initiative, Smart Power for Rural Development, we're pursuing a model that would use a new mini-grid technology 
powered by clean alternative energy sources. The innovation is bringing together three types of customers. An anchor tenant, telecommunication companies that need electricity to run their mobile phone towers and who are currently relying on expensive and environmentally polluting diesel. Small enterprises such as carpenters or little agro businesses that need electricity to operate and grow and will pay for reliable electricity. And villagers who can only pay some tiny amount, but they only need a tiny amount of electricity. And then their households stand to gain major economic and education benefits, and the data are very strong there. Our hypothesis is that securing the telecom as a contractually guaranteed customer can finally make it profitable for smaller scale energy services companies to bring electricity to rural parts of the developing world where so many efforts have previously failed. While it's not yet a proven model that can attract commercial investors, again, the Rockefeller Foundation is working to de-risk these investments for impact investors and prove that this model can be profitable and scaled first across India and then across the developing world. This could be truly transformative. But to solve challenges as complex as those facing humanity today, we often need the combination of innovations both in models and in mechanisms. That's what we're learning through our work on resilience, and I'm so thrilled that SOCAP has featured resilience as a track at this year's conference. In today's world, shocks, earthquakes, droughts, floods, pandemics, as well as slower burning stresses such as joblessness and civil unrest are coming faster and they're staying longer. Through our resilience work, which over the course of the last decade has funded or committed more than half a billion dollars, we've learned that investing in resilience not only mitigates the damage caused by disasters and stresses, but also creates benefits for people in good times as well. We call this the resilience dividend. And this graphic shows some of the benefits that we've seen already, including more job opportunities, lower operating risks for business, better coordination among government silos, and greater social cohesion. To help more cities and rural communities achieve the resilience dividend, we're pursuing innovations in both financial mechanisms and models. One is our 100 Resilient Cities Challenge, a $100 million Rockefeller commitment, which focuses on building urban resilience in 100 cities worldwide. We've leveraged our 100 million and created a platform of resilience goods and services for the cities that are actually providing hundreds of millions of dollars more from entities as diverse as Palantir, the World Bank Group, Ushahidi, Sandia National Laboratories, and Swiss Re, with several others to be announced in the next few weeks. I encourage you to attend the session later if you're interested in learning more. In addition to changing the way entities approach financing resilience, we're also exploring mechanisms that could be developed to make this easier, including infrastructure exchanges or resilience impact bonds. Let me conclude as follows. We've seen the power and we've seen the results of using our risk capital to test or scale a new financial mechanism or model. We have also seen over and over again that the best ideas come from many people in many places. And so in our search for the next leapfrog advance in innovative finance, we are asking you, the entrepreneurial community, to think about some of the innovations you've come across in your work or a new idea that you would like to test. Tell us by using the SOCAP 2014 and big ideas hashtags. Does it bring in more capital, private capital, to the social sector? Does it focus on new ways to catalyze social entrepreneurship? Can it promote new and exciting types of partnerships? Or might it build resilience and more inclusive economies? So if you have one big idea or two or three, we want to hear it. Members of our innovative finance team will be monitoring the conversation, so will many others. And for many of those, we will follow up directly. 
but we'll also, if you would like, promote your ideas through our deep and expansive network of enterprises, innovators, and funders who share your passion for achieving social good. We are absolutely confident that with the collective wisdom of the SOCAP community, we can help transform and change today's new ideas into tomorrow's next great transformation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Judith. It's always great to hear what Rockefeller is doing. And now that we've heard about the powerful potential of impact investing and been given some ideas about how to accelerate that even more through what Rockefeller is working on, we're going to turn to three people who are great friends of SOCAP. These three folks have gone under the hood to get the real scoop of what's going on in this field, and they're co-authors of a new book that just about everybody here is going to want a copy of. That book coming out in October is called The Impact Investor, A Practitioner's Guide on How to Succeed in Impact Investing. Sound good? They are going to talk to us about what they think we need to truly ignite the social capital markets. Please join me in welcoming longtime SOCAP veterans and our partners, Kathy Clark, Ben Thornley, and Jed Emerson. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Rosalie. Thanks, Kevin. Liz, Lindsay, everyone at SOCAP, do an incredible job. Now, I have the, uh, the best job uh, here of the three of us this morning uh, because I get to share some good news with you that you don't already know. And that is that you are special. <laughs> Did we not know that already? <laughs> so why are we special? Because social entrepreneurship and impact investing are inherently about cross-sector collaboration. They're about using the tools, the practices, and the languages of the nonprofit sector, of business and finance, and of public policy. Think of Revolution Foods, for example, a fantastic business that works within a highly regulated, heavily constrained environment of school lunch programs or Living Cities, which is a collaboration of over 20 of the largest foundations and financial institutions concerned about development in low-income communities in the United States, or Microvest, which describes the social ballast of its non-profit owners and the commercial sale of an institutional, uh, extremely uh, innovative approach to the way that it invests in microfinance institutions. And this multilingual leadership is the future. Hillary Clinton talking at the State Department's Impact Economy Initiative. We were over the separation mentality. Paul Polman from Unilever, being less bad, corporate social responsibility is not good enough anymore. We need partnerships that probably haven't been done before. This is Dominic Barton the Global Managing Director of McKinsey, talking about the need for corporate leaders to be tri-sector athletes. And finally, from the nonprofit world, Leslie Crutchfield and Heather McLeod, Grant, talking about collective impact being about partnership across sectors. Millennials are talking about business as being for improving society. This is the future in their eyes. And Audrey Choi, at Morgan Stanley, talks about millennials not investing the same way again. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was very insightful. Um, so uh, before we go on with the shtick, I just want to say I always love coming to SOCAP because it's kind of like a gathering of the tribes and kind of like a large extended family reunion. And uh, in working with Ben and Kathy over the past two years doing this research, we've also kind of like become our own little family. Uh, you know, as you just experienced, Ben is kind of like the mom telling you how special you are and attractive and intelligent. Kathy's kind of like the kind of slightly bossy but still very sweet older sister who kind of like <laughs> makes things happen and makes sure you stay on track. And you'll experience that during her comments. 
I'm kind of more like the crazy, slightly drunk uncle who makes inappropriate <laughs> comments. So I just want to kind of break, brace yourself for that. So uh, 15 years ago, the, the blended value papers started talking about this idea of uh, mutant managers and that we needed 21st century leaders who could rise up out of their silo and see across the space and take us somewhere different, somewhere better, somewhere integrated, uh, somewhere more whole as opposed to bifurcated. And Ben just walked you through a number of very smart and intelligent folks who have also come to that same conclusion, that it's time for a different way to think about leadership and a way to think about how we're moving forward. And we termed the phrase multilingual leadership because in our research what we found was that those funds that really were outperforming as impact investing funds, those funds that did best on a, both a financial basis and a social and environmental basis were funds that were led by individuals and teams that could also kind of cross cut. And what we've realized as we've kind of talked this through over time is that these people, if you'll excuse the phrase, kind of dumb fucked their way to the top because they started at Goldman Sachs and they did five years and then they went to the IFC and they did five years and they went to Ghana and they ran a microfinance fund and then they came back and they worked for a foundation and then they wrote a book or a paper or an article. They basically found their way through this process over five, 10 or 20 years of a career. And the problem is as a community, we are all basically winging it. We are basically making it up as we go along, and that's cool, right? That's how you get innovation, that's just the reality that we're playing with, but it really is time that we move from winging it to a more structured approach to thinking about leadership development for impact investing. Now, the, the problem that we have is that foundations, even in things that they claim to care about, such as nonprofit management, invest less than 1% of their annual giving budgets in leadership development initiatives. To say nothing to the fact that things that they talk about caring about, like impact investing, they virtually invest zero. And we, this is why we go to family offices and pension funds and others to really move money into impact investing vehicles. But if that weren't enough, if you think about the offerings that are available to young leaders coming up, to the millennials that Ben talked about, while there's been a doubling of the offerings of dual degree programs at the master's level, where you could in fact be trained in a both and kind of mindset and set of practices, the actual uptake of those offerings is less than 1%. And so, as we think about it, we're talking about leaders that are coming into this space, and we're talking about those of you in this room who spend a lot of time grappling with the fundamentals of what is impact investing. What is it that we really should be focused on and thinking about? And so we spend all this time talking about impact investing as very idiosyncratic and it's very subjective and it's this and it's that. And so we're finding our way through the process, if you will, as opposed to leading ourselves into a process of mutual edification and guidance, of sharing, of collaboration, of really learning the new skill sets that we'll need for the future. And the future really is a function of leaders who understand that successful impact investing is a function of alignment of stakeholder and investor interests. It's a function of a focus on outcomes and performance and impact. It's a function of transparency and being clear on what it is that we're doing and disseminating that to others so we can all grow together into this new role of leadership of the whole. Thanks, Jared. So what can we do about this? How can we develop ourselves and our teams to, to be better multilingual leaders? Well, the first thing we can do is actually elevate the discussion of this concept and commit to it. What does it mean to assess your own skills? What does it mean to assess the skills of your teams? And what can you then put in action to be intentional about developing those skills and talents? What we are excited to invite you to do this year, since the theme of SOCAP is ignition, is to invite you to take an Ignite pledge to think about these issues for yourselves and within your organizations. So first is innovate. How can you decide this year to do something innovative around multilingual leadership within your organization? The second is to guide 
to support other organizations who are thinking about doing this. It takes two to be cross-sector, so you can be the recipient of this kind of partnership as well. Network. How often do you attend a conference in a different sector on the area that you are working on? Can you do that more? Include. Invite people from other sectors into your work, onto your advisory board, um, into your work in other ways. Talk. Talk about what this is like. Um, and the last is educate, uh, which is really to think about how can you cultivate a culture within your organization that supports people with different mindsets and different backgrounds feeling comfortable and contributing uh, to, a, to, a, to a better whole. Um, we are really excited um, this year at SOCAP. We're trying a, a few new things around this idea of multilingual leadership. Um, and we're really inviting you to join with us uh, in figuring that out. The first thing is we released a survey last week. Many people in the room have already taken it. It's about a 10-minute online quiz at bit.ly slash MLL survey. And when you take it, it assesses your skills and knowledge across the three sectors and gives you a score. Uh, and so you can get a sense of where you fall. On Thursday, we're going to run um, an experimental workshop for two hours at 11 o'clock. We have 12 expert impact investors who are going to serve as coaches and walk people through exercises within each sector. We'd love to have you join us at that, and we're going to reveal the results of the survey at that point tomorrow morning. Um, we are also really excited that we have been able to get a preview uh, PDF version of our new book. Uh, that's coming out next month, but the publisher has allowed us to share one with everyone at SOCAP, and you're going to be getting that through Pathable uh, later today. Hope you'll take a look at it. A lot of the deeper ideas that we are, we are, we have, um, that, that led to this notion of multilingual leadership are in that book. And then last, I'm really excited to say that my organization, which is the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship at the Fuqua School of Business at Duke, is going to make this a year of multilingual leadership. We're going to be delving into this issue publishing blogs, connecting what other people are doing, and we'd really like to invite you to be part of this so that we can learn from you. So please follow us at our Twitter hashtag at Case at Duke, um, or if you want to tweet about this issue, we have uh, claimed the hashtag uh, multilingual. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is a wonderful friend of ours who I got to meet a few months ago at our home in Asheville and to hear about her work, Shirley Sharkey, the CEO of St. Elizabeth Health St. Elizabeth Healthcare in Canada, has a great story. It's an amazing story of how indigenous work in local communities has grown to a $300 million health care system under Shirley's leadership. Please welcome to the SOCAP stage, Shirley Sharkey. OMG, we are all here at SOCAP 2014. And in San Francisco, which is a wonderful, vibrant, vibrant place that's about neighborhoods. And actually, I was reading that it's described as 49 square miles of endless possibilities. And isn't that so aligned with the theme of igniting vibrant communities? I'm really pleased to talk to you about St. Elizabeth and our story and journey over the last few years. St. Elizabeth is a little different as an organization, and some people think we actually have multiple personalities. We are a nonprofit charity. Some describe us as Canada's largest social enterprise. Some view us as an investor, others as an investee. We have an army of 7,000 workers, personal support workers, nurses, rehab staff, physicians who care for people primarily in their homes and in their communities. Our revenues and resources hover around 300 million. And on any given day, we are servicing 11,000 clients. But to our core, St. Eliz is all about hope and happiness for society and for the world at large. That is St. Elizabeth today. But in 1992, it was a little different as an organization. We were, in fact, um, 
much smaller, about 300 staff, very geographically dispersed. We had some interesting and challenging governments. We had a friendly culture, but a little quirky. A lot of challenges dealing with uh, multicultural uh, populations. And our finances were really shaky. So we said, well, all right, how can we make a change and what can we do? What I hope for this morning in these brief few minutes, I can encourage you and help you, as you all know, and understand that social impact and purpose can be a perfect marriage with business, and it can continue to be a loving relationship. So, on to the journey of St. Elizabeth. In my early days as CEO, and I started way back in 1992, we had, as a health organization, very traditional success. A lot of government contracts, primarily in the home care space, and started to move into servicing some of the marginalized groups, the First Nations populations, the homeless populations. They were very small. We were growing and diversifying primarily in government-funded initiatives. But, you know, I kept thinking there should be more. With the success that we are having with our growth, we should be doing more for society. And then in 2012, I read a great article by Michael Porter and Mark Kramer, Creating Shared Value. And for me, it was one of those sort of eureka moments. It was as if Porter and Kramer had got inside my brain and started to organize the disjointed thoughts I had about social impact, purpose, and the success of a business. And their article really was all about the fact that capitalism was broken. And they saw a way companies could knit society and companies back together by using shared value that connected social issues and economic issues. And that would unleash a powerful force. And the engine would be turbocharged for social impact, and innovation would be the gasoline. So it occurred to us at St. Eliz, well, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. Why can't we, as a nonprofit, in fact, be a social ecosystem? Why can't we rise to this occasion? So we took on the challenge of a somewhat painful process to try to embed more fully in our organization social value and what that would really mean as we continued to further our business success. And it's been a work in progress um, as an organization, just as I am a work in progress, and we continue to learn along the way. But I wanted to share with you three key themes that I think have helped us in this journey uh, for, for success in the social enterprise space. And they are stick to your commitment, lots and lots of little mistakes, and scale and size. From a commitment point of view, St. Louis certainly had a head start because our origins 106 years ago was to heal the sick. And it was to, in fact, actually birth babies in their home environment. So we were very clear about our social purpose. But it took commitment over the last few years with a very successful, primarily government-funded organization at every level, including the board level, to go, why are you looking for trouble? Your business model works, just keep growing and expanding. But I think that helped us commit even more to the conviction, no, we want to do more. And it's less about the strength of St. Elizabeth and more about how we're going to impact society. But it was a journey with a lot of commitment and a lot of confusion, which needed a lot of courage to move forward. And of course, there were a lot of mistakes and continue to be mistakes. And our mantra has always been, act, implement, the mistake is there, fail quickly, move to the next. That is the only way we're moving forward. And I think you can really define what an organization is all about by how they celebrate the mistakes 
versus necessarily how they celebrate the successes. Our key mistakes, I think, fell into two categories. And one was timing. Some things were way too fast what we were expecting to do. And as we know, you can't hurry love. Other things were slow. And we started, started to see new ideas and new solutions. And we said, wow, we should have been there. And understanding that innovation to move it forward into the next space. Said, so we've got to make sure we structure the organization to allow that to happen. Thirdly, we underestimated the confusion for our organization when we said we're going to be a social enterprise. And many said, well, aren't you already that? What have you been doing? And to really work through what we were striving for from a societal impact was very interesting. Size and scale has probably been, I think, the most significant um, learning lesson for us in that we had to be patient with our organic growth and also through acquisitions to begin to understand how we could use our weight and our brand to actually benefit society. And we conduct now 6.4 million visits or exchanges to people throughout the year. And our thought was this could be a tremendous test bed that we could allow people to use so we could begin to actually harness the power of people and get change to happen, get transformation to happen for tomorrow. And it, it, it was a leap of faith. Today, it's not just our size, but the fact that the organization is very committed to innovation that has moved us to use that size and space very, very differently. Internally, with our 7,000 staff, we are using a social media platform called Soapbox, which allows all of our staff at any time to provide their ideas to us so how we can spread that hope and happiness. But you've got to be ready to listen to those ideas and respond to them. And that's been a really interesting insight for us to see how the power of people, both internally and externally, can help you achieve the heights you're trying to move into. So thankfully, as I stand here today on the stage, we have had, I think, some very positive outcomes. Firstly, innovation is embedded in the DNA of our organization. And it's not just innovation for change, but social innovation. And what I've done is really cocooned an uh, incredible motivated workforce that has been charged to go outside of the healthcare world and see where we're doing things better. And to bring in those ideas and resource those ideas within the organization. We have very interesting titles for these positions and they report directly to me and it has allowed the organization to understand how this is so important as a priority and it's the gasoline that will make us successful. Ventures is another area where St. Elizabeth has quite frankly put our money where our mouth is. And we have put money aside to fund other ventures, other initiatives, amazing entrepreneurs and help them to help themselves to create the kinds of solutions that will help society at large improve. And we've been part of accelerator programs and a number of wonderful initiatives that is bringing the inside, outside in to St. Elizabeth. Lastly, collaboration has been another outcome where we've been partnering with very different players than a traditional 100-year-old health organization typically partners with. And they've been everything from technology labs to colleges of arts and design to again help us come up with new ideas and new solutions to help service marginalized groups, help transform care that we're providing, and help people in fact improve their lives and improve the outcome. So in conclusion, as I reflect, the story sounds like it was very linear and predictable, but it's really only been in hindsight that I've been able to put them into themes and compartmentalize the journey. 
What's been clear from the beginning, however, is the speed, the sprint, the space we're in that requires a huge pace of activity. And like the title of today's talk, OMG, here's tomorrow. What I think is most important is we all remember how relentless we must be to get the changes that are necessary. No matter where our beginnings are as organizations, as, inventor, as investors, as inventees, it's all a part of an ecosystem to get the solutions. And I hope in these few brief remarks I've given you encouragement to, in fact, imagine the possibilities and move forward on your dreams. Because like the wonderful quote from the very wise Dr. Seuss, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Let's make sure it does get better. Thank you very much. Everybody, uh, I am uh, a person who always likes to find out what those who are coming on stage would like me to tell you about them. So I asked our next two speakers what they'd like me to say, and they said, just tell everybody how dashing we are. So I'm here to introduce the dashing Anthony Buglevine and the dashing Willie Foote, who are actually going to have a conversation here on stage. What what the conversation is about really is, is about the doing of it. Um, these are two fellows who spend every day boots on the ground doing deals, practicing our work, and um, they have some reflections that they want to share with us. So I hope you'll help me welcome them. Thank you. I can't speak for the dashing, but at least I have more hair than Willie. Yes. Um, so we're just really excited to be here. Um, I know many of you have been here for a few years. Some of you are new. Um, but for us, it's really amazing to be here leading organizations that have been doing this work for, in the case of my organization, more than 30 years and Willie, more than a decade, uh, to talk just for a few minutes about what it really takes to make impact investing work. Um, and specifically, we just wanted to talk about three things, what we do, what it takes for it to work, and then most importantly, what are we learning from the doing of it? Uh, many of us for many years have been talking a lot, uh, writing, listening, um, but it's a rare opportunity to learn from a doer like Willie, and I'll talk about what my team does as well. Um, my sense is that at, at SOCAP, there's always three kinds of people in impact investing. There's haters who really believe that what we're doing either is crazy or destructive. Uh, there are hypers who say that everything about impact investing is amazing, is going to work really simply. Um, and then they're doers. And I really think of Willie as an amazing example of, of a doer from whom we can learn. And I know you guys have been sitting for a while, so I just want everyone to stand up. And it's really quickly. Uh, if you characterize yourself as a doer, stay standing. Uh, if you're a hyper or a hater or hopefully something else, uh, have a seat. We just want to get a sense of um, who we are. I know none of the haters are going to, you know, coming here and being a hater is like going to Yankee Stadium as a Red Sox fan, which I've done. Uh, so you're not going to own it, but if you're a doer, uh, stay standing, and if not, uh, take a seat. Um, great. So we have a lot of self-described doers. Um, so maybe we don't have a lot to teach you guys, but hopefully we'll be able to uh, share some insights from what we're doing. So just wanted to start, and uh, we're a little bit rushed, um, but really just starting to talk briefly about what we do. I said to Willie early that anyone who comes to SOCAP and doesn't know what Willie Foot does and what Root Capital is about, um, maybe you should do a little bit more research, but he's not as presumptuous as I am, so he insists on telling you a little bit about what he does at Root Capital, uh, then I'll talk a little bit about what I do at Nonprofit Finance Fund, uh, and then we'll talk about what it takes to succeed, and most importantly, what it is we've learned from the doing since we were last year. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, speaking of haters, my mother, I mean, well, my wife hates the jacket I'm wearing now because it's fake leather. Uh, but I've worn it virtually every single time I've been on stage or hung out with, uh, with Anthony. So that's why it's here. Thank you for indulging me. Um, super excited. But he excited. left his guitar at home, so 
those of you who know about that will be appreciated. Excited to be back at SOCAP, and what a wonderful theme, um, igniting vibrant communities. Just quickly kind of laying out what we do at Root Capital. So we're, we're an impact-first agricultural lender and uh, enterprise accelerator, if you will. Um, we, um, the mission is to grow prosperity in rural areas, right, in poor, environmentally vulnerable places, and we do that by investing in agricultural businesses that build sustainable livelihoods for small-scale farmers who often lack, you know, the very basics, clean water, electricity, medicine. So specifically, we lend capital, we deliver financial training, and we strengthen market connections for small and growing agricultural businesses. So we're kind of, we're a social purpose ag lender, really the combination of a non-bank financial institution and an NGO uh, that we founded 15 years ago to address the missing middle of rural finance, right? Businesses that might aggregate uh, or serve hundreds or thousands of farmers, but they get stuck in that missing middle, too big for microfinance, too small, too risky, too remote uh, for the banks. And really, we start from the conviction that these agricultural businesses, whether they're a farmer association or a private entrepreneur that's working with smallholders uh, through, say, outgrower schemes or a seed company or an agro-processor, they're an economic engine that drives prosperity in rural areas. Uh, and the challenge is they get stuck in the missing middle so they can't access capital or qualified employees or markets that they need to, um, to grow their operation or invest in infrastructure or merely pay the farmers on time, right? So they, they, they're missing out on good business opportunities, and too often they fail to flourish. So we've grown pretty quickly in recent years, um, and a lot of uh, uh, challenges there. Uh, but this year we're on track to lend $155 million to an active portfolio of nearly 300 businesses that um, reach roughly 500,000 farm households across 33 countries. And so including, for instance, $2.5 million that'll go to four businesses representing 18,000 coffee farmers in the Congo, in the Eastern DRC. And so just maybe to wrap, regardless of how much we lend or where we lend, the larger vision is really to try to catalyze a smallholder agricultural finance industry that serves all 500,000, I'm sorry, 500 million small scale farm households uh, in the world. And we'll do that by um, demonstrating business opportunities in the countryside with many others and crowding in competition. And this is a more recent thing and awkward but very powerful. Working with our peer institutions, aka our competitors, to blueprint this nascent industry of, of smallholder agricultural finance and create the kind of standards and best practices that will underpin a thriving agricultural finance market that, uh, that is stable, that's sustainable, that's responsible, that's inclusive, um, hopefully that, you know, that, that ignites vibrant communities. Right. So what Willie's been doing for 15 years at Root Capital, which is really combining capital and expertise to unlock the potential of his clients, who are these cooperatives and other organizations that are enabling farmers to get the most value out of their work, is a real parallel for what we at the Nonprofit Finance Fund have been doing for 34 years here in the U.S., where our clients are nonprofit organizations. They are health clinics, homeless shelters, soup kitchens, charter schools, uh, performing arts centers, all of whom similarly are being hampered by their inability to access the right combination of the right kind of investment capital and the expertise that they need to run their organization as an effective business. And so we began in 1980 in New York City, and you probably figured out that I'm young enough that I, uh, when I say this, it's a, with a bit of a wink, but I always say, you know, you remember in 19, the late 1970s that the oil price had spiked. Um, I don't, but I think some people in this room do. Not too many people, though, looking out. Um, but the oil price had spiked in 1970, and a lot of the old homeless shelters and settlement houses in New York City were built in the 20s and 30s by the first wave of philanthropy that had come to New York. And those were old, hulking buildings that were incredibly energy inefficient. In 1980, they came to their funder, the New York Community Trust, who had funded them for years, and said, our heating oil bills have gone up. We need a bigger grant to cover our increased costs. Because that's what nonprofits did. They covered their costs by going to foundations, getting grant money, going to governments, and getting contracts. The Nonprofit Finance Fund was born out of a very simple but powerful idea that rather than going and getting another grant from the foundation, what those organizations really needed was a loan to do two things. 
put a new boiler in their basements that could be more energy efficient, and put new windows in the buildings that would trap their heat. And with that loan, they would be able to reduce the amount of heating oil they needed to the extent that they could repay the loan and end up with a better capitalized organization. That's a really simple idea. And now we call it green retrofit finance and everyone's excited about it. Back then it didn't have a name, but it was something we started doing. But it was also a really radical idea because the premise was that a nonprofit organization could access finance and think of itself as a business that had revenues and cash flows that could ultimately support a loan. And that's the idea we were born out of in 1980. Um, and since then, we haven't grown as quickly as Willie has, um, but we've done about $320 million worth of lending. We've made 700 loans, never lost a dollar of our investors' money, um, and last year lent across the country to a wide range of organizations, pursuing that basic understanding that as a nonprofit organization that's mission-oriented, you don't need to be excluded from the capital markets and from the opportunities that investment capital has. And on the other hand, as investors, are the people we borrow from, who we are paying back, have bought into the idea that they can make investments that support both the social purpose they care about as well as their financial return. So that's what we do. Um, and Willie and I over the years have had many conversations about the surprising parallels between our work despite it being on the face quite different in terms of the kinds of clients we fund and specifically where we work. And so we just wanted to talk briefly about what have we learned from all this doing, about what it takes and what does it take to make this work and why can it be powerful? So, yeah, for us, um, success factors maybe. Uh, we could go into, I think, a whole host of success factors about our own shops that for us would be, for instance, embedding deeply in local talent and local markets and local culture, uh, being as close as possible to your clients, um, building deep industry expertise. But, I want to share, I think, the most important point that's relevant for a SOCAP would be the following, that for us, success has been all about identifying the early stage agricultural businesses that have um, huge potential for impact, economic, social, environmental, but that face a ton of challenges that, if addressed, they become an engine of prosperity for countless uh, uh, rural um, kind of households. And the, the, the challenges are, are daunting. If you take Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, governments on average spend 5% of national budgets on agriculture, even though it's the primary economic activity of 70% of the population. So massive underinvestment in agriculture has left the continent uh, in Africa decades behind other developing regions. So as much as anything, our journey at Root Capital has been kind of a process of continual discovery and understanding of the constraints to business growth and success. And so it's not just at, say, the firm level, weak financial management, for instance, but weak sourcing channels from farmers dependent on NGOs for inputs and technical assistance, right? Poor infrastructure, um, you know, bad roads, unreliable electricity, crappy cold chain, the usual host of inhibitory laws and regulations and subsidies and taxes. So, in short, it's really tough to serve that lower segment, the lower end of the agricultural finance market. And I would say over the years, and this is probably the most relevant comment maybe I have to share today um, in terms of our, if not success factors, our experience, is that um, critical thing has been not over-promising and not over-selling, that lots of good and lots of deep impact will happen without real risk and cost and even in some cases, significant subsidy. And we like to joke on our team that we're at the high risk, low return sweet spot of smallholder agricultural finance. And what we mean by that is that, you know, on the continuum of where mainstream markets meet clients' needs efficiently, on one side and on the other where economic realities dictate um, you know, exclusive reliance on charity, we are squarely positioned in the capital preservation camp, like paying a small coupon um, combined with rigorous impact measurement, but also raising enterprise philanthropy to build a balance sheet and for capacity building and for industry facilitation. And always, always with a view toward reaching those earlier stage businesses and helping to unlock their growth and their impact in spite of all the challenges. And just one last point on this, and maybe this is a, like a call to action, but for, for those of you who aspire to reach those 
least served market segments, and I hope many of, of us do, um, consider what we call the cross-subsidy model, where in our case, we are building the, a pipeline of early stage businesses for ourselves and for the larger industry, um, knowing that those early stage clients are going to be typically loss leaders at first. And then we accompany their growth, right, over time to the point where um, we achieve operational sustainability through a cross-subsidy from the larger clients that are profitable to serve. And so we're not maximizing return necessarily at root capital, but what we are doing is helping to ensure that this agricultural finance market is inclusive in addition to being stable and sustainable and, and responsible. Yeah, I think it's really true, and I've heard Willie say this before, that knowing who you are and being clear about that is a really important success factor. And, and I joke that the impact investing is like a wedding. Those of you who've been at, at SoCap for a few years will know that we were earlier we were in this sort of weird phase after the ceremony when everyone's standing around, they're passing around hors d'oeuvres, but you don't know who's in the bride's party, you don't know who's in the groom's party, you're not sure who you should be talking to. And it's quite chaotic, and in that moment, everyone can sort of present to be something different to different people. So you talk to one person, you say, I can deliver you market rate returns. Then you talk to a foundation, you say, I'm all about impact. Now we're moving into the seated dinner phase, where you get to look underneath your name tag and you see table one, and table one, you're sitting with Willie, and Willie's about, I'll preserve your capital, I'll deliver incredibly strong impact, and I'll do the really hard things. And that's where we are on the US side. Over in table eight are people who are managing fiduciary money with the risk compliant pension funds, who are doing something different. We need it all, and you wouldn't have a wedding party under that tent if you didn't have everyone. But I think being really clear and not trying to deal with that confusing period by trying to pitch yourself in too many ways to too many people has been very helpful for us in our work. We are absolutely in that same camp as Willie. We haven't lost our investors' money, and we can't because of who we borrow from. We borrow We've from the big banks. lost a little bit of our investors' money, just a little. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just a little. He has, he has better investors than I do, or more, more lenient. Um, but I think certainly for us, it's... You know, it's a similar story in the U.S. And we don't have, our clients don't have problems with roads and they don't have problems with the power going off all the time that really hampers their ability to operate. But they do operate in a crazy system. It's a system where at the best of times, nonprofits are delivering 1% or 2% margins. Uh, we do a survey every year of the state of the nonprofit sector in the U.S. And we can tell you that half of all nonprofits have less than 90 days of cash on hand at any time. That's who we're lending to. In the good years, if they manage their contracts well, they're maybe making a slim margin. Those contracts are often getting upturned for very strange reasons. So I think so similar, we are finding that in our work, to be successful creates, you can't just simply put the money out there and say, well, come to us people who want deals. Um, and it's not just about finding the deals, but it's what my team does is not take more risk, but work much harder and be much more creative to turn what a regular banker would look at as a completely unviable deal and work to make it happen. And subsidy is often a big part of that. Um, but there's no substitute we've also found, and this is, for me, transitioning from being a, a, a hyper of impact investing and understanding it theoretically to running an investment fund. One of the biggest things I've learned is how important it is to get into what I call the black box of the client. Rather than just saying, if we create the investment fund and there's clearly a capital need, those two things will meet. They don't meet in a marketplace. They meet in the context of a very specific investment you make into a very specific for-profit or non-profit entity, and understanding how that entity works and the pressures that are on that team is the starting point for us to be successful in what we do. Um, so I see we're running out of time, and I wanted to make sure that we got to what I think is the most exciting thing to be here talking about, and that is what are we actually learning from doing? So what I asked Willie to think about, and I'll offer my thoughts, is since we were last at SOCAP, and were you here last year? No. So he has two years. years, I have one year. Um, what do we now know about this work that we did not know in his case two years ago, in my case one year ago, because of the doing we've been doing over the last year. So what are the few things you've learned since last time you were here, Willie? Okay, so I have a tendency to overshare. So I'm gonna overshare a little bit. Um, I think what I have learned, what we have learned as an organization is how much trouble you can get into. If you don't have clear expectations up front with your investors and your donors about one really key thing, which is, that you can't decode everything up front in the face of market failure, that we have to dive into this work, but with our supporters, we need to have room and license to adapt and iterate. And if you don't set that expectation very clearly up front, you can, you, there can be serious misalignment. So our, just our quick story, um, we hit serious headwinds in 2013. 
as an organization. First time ever we didn't grow, largely managing kind of macro forces that were um, beyond our control, um, but that can threaten even the best laid strategies. So for instance, uh, market externalities, collapse of the coffee price in 2013, coffee leaf rust disease, a biblical scourge that many of you will have read about um, that's hitting the Americas with a vengeance tied to climate change. Um, the rising competition from other social lenders, God bless them, moving into our space, a great thing for market creation. Uh, meanwhile, we had recently undertaken a large multi-year pre-raise of capital for a, a debt and grant funding for a five-year strategic plan, which was pretty successful, the pre-raise. But we didn't hit our targets last year um, in terms of volume, credit volume, in terms of revenue, in terms of risk. Not radically off, but we didn't hit our targets um, as a result of managing these headwinds. And um, some got spooked and, uh, and, and pulled out, even as others kind of deepened their engagement. But in the end, our kind of successful pre-raise kind of unraveled. So here's what we did quickly um, right. This is what we did just because I, I don't want my communications person is glowering at me right now. What we did right last year was we very aggressively communicated and shared our learnings throughout uh, the headwinds with our investors and our donors and our board and everyone else. We, um, we implemented lean cost controls, but being very careful not to undermine our productive capability in the field, where most of our team are local Africans and Latin Americans spread across eight regional offices. Um, we focused on voice of customer business initiatives to manage the situation, and I think actually got um, better, much better at um, serving our clients. And then this year, the market, certainly in coffee, uh, the market rebounded. Uh, and um, albeit with a lot higher volatility in, in the commodity markets in general that we need to manage. And we were there ready and standing by to resume growth kind of together, together with our clients. So two key learnings in our wrap. First one, I mentioned it. Again, you cannot decode everything up front, and you really need to have, kind of like in Silicon Valley as a tech company, you need to have the license and the room uh, to iterate and to adapt to changing circumstances, we should have done a better uh, job of setting those expectations up front, and we certainly intend to do that going forward. Um, second key learning, and this is kind of picking up on some of the themes that Anthony just mentioned, and I'll close here. We appreciate now that impact investing is much more specialized with a lot more segments uh, within it than even just a few years ago. So you've got government agencies and corporates and foundations and religious pension funds and high net worth individuals and family offices and so on and so forth. And with that comes many different theories of change, right? Everybody has their own theory of change. And so you have to, and that's not a problem, but you have to be very careful about aligning your theory of change, even if it's artfully adaptive, but not bleeding into chameleon-like your theory of change with the theory of change of your, of, your, of your investors. And so, for instance, finding alignment around, in our case, financial, what's your philosophy behind financial performance, right? In our case, operating self-sufficiency or OSS or break-even is a very key driver of internal operational efficiency, right? And it's an important indicator for achieving a demonstration effect. But it's not the most important one. It's not the only one, and you have to weigh it against mission trade-offs in terms of maximizing financial return versus, as I mentioned earlier, creating a very inclusive market as a catalyst kind of pipeline builder for our industry. Another one is, in our case, we are absolutely in the school of a multi-pronged strategy to achieve impact at scale. And, and so it's inextricably linked. Finance, advise, catalyze, lend capital, build local capacity through financial management training so folks can better compete in global or local markets, and then catalyze an industry, thought leadership, field building, impact measurement, and so on. All three together are the three legs of the stool. My father, by the way, said to me once, please don't call it a strategic stool. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, but those three together, uh, do you have alignment? Or people like, I don't care about the advice stuff, I don't care about the catalyzed stuff, they're, they're inextricably linked. And lastly, within the factory gates, what's your direct service delivery? What about outside your factory gates? Like, what do you do through partnerships? How do you engage at the landscape level? How do you leverage the ecosystem? All of these things in the face of what is a multidimensional, very complex thing called poverty. So what I can promise is this year, um, come back, coming back next year, we will have learned a lot more, and we will unapologetically continue to adapt and to iterate uh, into next year. That's great. And I would recommend, I think 
Willie and his team are a gold standard in communication, and it's all on his website, rootcapital.org. Um, really great quarterly reporting, and are able to convey both the metrics as well as the stories of what they do. I'll just talk about what we've learned in the last year. Um, I think we've come here, and you're going to hear in a minute about a big policy initiative that some of us have been a part of. One of my biggest learnings is the role of government in impact investing. And last year when I was here, I said, don't ignore the role of government because government creates the conditions under which we can operate. I've really come to appreciate even more, it's not just that government creates the conditions, but if you are going to do impact investing, especially in a developed market where you are trying to assess or address issues of real poverty and social inequality and justice, ultimately you are going to be investing in organizations that rely on government funding to pay you back. That's a huge insight that I've had. My team probably had it 20 years ago. But a real understanding, it's not just that we need government to create the conditions of which we as private investors can make a difference. Almost all the work we do, at some point down the chain, we are getting repaid because government is helping to fund a service. It's true in the US, it's even more true in Europe um, and in the developed parts of Asia. So if you are operating in developed markets, let's give you three quick examples. Uh, we've helped finance a 200-bed homeless shelter on 25th Street in Manhattan, a $20 million project. We were able to lend $2 million into it. We are paid back because the city of New York and the state of New York are committed to funding those services. We are ultimately financing government through the financing of a nonprofit. Um, just south of here in Los Angeles, we've been financing an amazing charter school that sends a huge percentage of kids, not just to college, but gets them to graduate from college out of a high school they've set up. They needed money from us to rehab a building and start their new school. Ultimately, I'm going to get repaid when the state of California provides that charter school with the revenues they need to do the education and pay us back. We see this in sector after sector. There's a health clinic in rural Hawaii serving a population that previously had no access to primary health care in their community. We were able to make that loan, help that facility get started. Ultimately, it's government, Medicare, and Medicaid payments that are going to make that happen. So, Government and the role of government. You cannot be an impact investor and make a difference on real issues of deep poverty and social justice and inequality in a developed market if you do not get really smart about understanding and supporting the flows of government into your, bar, into your borrowers. The second thing we've learned, and again, I think the investors in this room with more experience than me would say this is a no-brainer, uh, it's about the management team. When I'm trying to get it, I just, we got a three and a half million dollar loan approved through our committees, and the loan is going to enable an amazing nonprofit to take a state contract um, and massively expand this delivery of health care into a certain population in the state they operate. To make that happen, they have to go from a 700-person team to a 1,400-person team, and that's what they needed the loan for. They needed upfront money to put in the IT systems, the recruiting practices, and get that engine going. Ultimately, I only got that loan through my committees because we were able to convince the committee that we absolutely believed in the management team of this organization. If you are not backing management teams, then you're backing real estate collateral, and you can do some great things, but ultimately, to do amazing work as an investor, you have to understand the management teams. And the last thing I'll say, and we've been told to wrap, is my biggest learning last year, and I think Willie certainly knows this is true, um, this is hard, and this is why I think the, the hypers out there are constantly looking for information that affirms their hypothesis that this is easy and inevitable. Uh, and the haters out there look at any kind of hiccup and say, see, we were right, this is impossible, you can't do it. Um, the main thing I've learned is that this is just really hard to do, and there's lots of ways. Elizabeth Littlefield was mentioned earlier at OPIC. Um, she has a great line. She says, you know, there are a lot easier ways for me to make money. I do what I do. At the simplest level, what we do, we do because we aren't the kinds of people who are trying to do the easy thing. Um, that's easy to say, and it's a lot harder to live with. You know, I think Willie talked about root capital doing cost alignment, I mean, that's a euphemism for an absolutely traumatic and emotional thing that goes through an organization that is trying to do something hard. Um, and it's not about, you know, you feel like you have a failure of leadership, but what we do is really hard. Um, and I just learned, again, that's why just going back to, you know, accept that this is hard. And what Willie said earlier, we are not going to learn by sitting and talking. We're going to learn by doing, and doing with a humility that comes from knowing that what we do is hard, um, and what we do is supremely worth it. Um, so I'm just really excited to uh, be able to share these thoughts, and it's always great to be on stage with Willie, and very much look forward to hopefully being able to work with many of you in the, in the coming years as you take on this journey and, and grow with us. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to make an important announcement, uh, particularly for those of you who might be feeling a little panicked about 
where you're going next and what time it is. Um, we are celebrating Latin American time today and uh, therefore are running a little bit behind schedule. At the end of this program, Rosalie will come out and give us all information about how we'll be running the rest of the day. But please don't worry if you want to sit in for the rest of these sessions and you think you also want to be at something that starts uh, at 10.45, for example. I also now am introducing a woman that I've respected for all of my adult career. Her name is Judy Wicks. She is the founder of the White Dog Cafe in Philadelphia. She's a, a pioneer in the uh, local food movement. And if you're interested in her book, she's just completed her memoirs, which are called Good, Mo Good Morning, Beautiful Business. And she's doing a book signing this afternoon at 1.15 over at our Impact Hub space. So please welcome Judy Wicks. Thank you, Penelope, and thank you to Rosalie and Kevin for putting on SOCAP. This is my first time here, and I'm having a ball. That's a great party. Uh, so uh, during my years um, that I lived above my business, the White Dog Cafe in Philadelphia, I had a sign in my bedroom closet that I would see each morning uh, that said, Good morning, beautiful business. And it was a reminder to me of just how beautiful business is when we put our creativity and our care and our energy uh, into producing a product or a service that our community needs. And I just realized that I don't have a clicker here. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Uh, so um, I would also take that time in the morning to think about our farmers um, out in the fields picking fresh organic uh, fruits and vegetables to bring into town that day, and I would think of the farm animals out on pasture enjoying fresh air and sunshine, and of our uh, goat herder, uh, Dougie, who said that when she kissed her goat's ears, it made the cheese better, and I think that's true. So for me, business is about relationships. Money is simply a tool. Business is about relationships with everyone that we buy from and sell to and work with and about our relationship with Earth itself and all the species who live here with us. My business was the way that I expressed my love of life and that's what made it a thing of beauty. Uh, oh, <laughs> thank you. So this is a, a, a photo of... Uh, Judy and Mark Dornstreich from Branch Creek Farm, a supplier of the White Dog Cafe. And Mark once told me that successful farming is the balance of masculine and feminine energy, of efficiency and nurturing. Too much efficiency and not enough er um, nurturing, you might have a well-run farm but a poor produce. On the other hand, uh, too much uh, nurturing may produce great tomatoes, uh, but you'll have a failed business in the end. Our industrial food system is all about efficiency and no nurturing whatsoever. It's about how much can we wring out of the soil and the workers and the animals and give as little back as possible. How little space do we give that egg-laying hen? How little light and air? How little food and water to get the cheapest egg possible? No nurturing there. In windowless factory farms, mother pigs are kept in crates so small that they can't take a step forward or backward or turn around or lie down almost their entire lives. They never feel a ray of sunshine or have a breath of fresh air. They never get to socialize with other pigs, though they're very social creatures. They're artificially inseminated. The babies are taken away prematurely, artificially inseminated again as though they were pieces of, of equipment in a factory. But pigs are mammals, like our dogs, like us. They're intelligent beings with a capacity for friendship and the range of emotions that all of our mam mammals share from um, joy to despair. When I first learned of these pig factories in 1999, I was horrified at the idea that I was serving this pig uh, a product uh, in my restaurant that came from this cruel system. So I finally went into the kitchen and said, take all the pork off the menu, the ham, the bacon, the pork chops, that we cannot be a part of this system, that we had to find a humane source. So we contacted our supplier of free-range chickens and eggs, and he led us to a farmer that raised pigs on pasture. Uh, and we were able to um, purchase two, two pigs a week. We bought the whole pig and learned how to use all the parts on our menu. Uh, then I learned about the plight of the cow. Uh, cows are herbivores. They're supposed to eat grass, but they're taken off pasture and fed grain uh, subsidized with our tax dollars uh, through the uh, farm bill. So... Um, Oops, that's not right. Oh, we skipped a slide here. Oh, well, sorry about that. Um, so um, we found a source for um, grass-fed 
beef um, and grass-fed dairy cows. Um, and finally, I looked at my menu and thought to myself, well, you've finally done it. Uh, we have a humane menu. All of our dairy and poultry uh, come from small family farms where there's plenty of nurturing. Um, this is going to be our market niche. This is our competitive advantage. This is all about us. Uh, but then my transformational moment came, and I said to myself, Judy, if you really do care about those pigs, if you really care about the small farmers being driven out by these big corporate farms, if you care about the environment that's being polluted by the concentration of 10,000 pigs in one barn that's polluting our air and our rivers, um, if you care about the consumers that are eating this meat full of antibiotics and hormones, uh, then you will, instead of keeping this as your competitive advantage, you will share this information with your competitors. Up until that point, I had thought that the best I could do as a responsible business person was to have good business practices within my company, to recycle and compost and pay a living wage and use renewable energy and so on. But I realized that there's no such thing as one sustainable business, that we can only be part of a sustainable system, and that we need to cooperate with each other, including our competitors, to build a whole economy that shares our values for fairness, compassion, and alignment with natural systems. So I asked the farmer who was bringing us two pigs a week, would you like to expand your business? And he said, yes. And I said, what's holding you back? And he said he needed $30,000 to buy a refrigerated truck so that he could deliver to more restaurants in town. So I loaned them the money, and he bought the truck to increase the supply of pastured pork to our city. Then I started a nonprofit with projects to increase the demand for local and to build our local and regional food systems and economy using 20% of the profits from my own business. Our first project was a wholesale directory that listed the farm products uh, available to our area, including all the farmers that the White Dog purchased from with their contact information, and handed it out to the other restaurants and stores in town. Through this work, we gradually expanded the network of farmers supplying uh, my own restaurant to a much larger network of farmers and small businesses supplying our region. It didn't take long before I realized that our local economy was a network within a still larger network, the global economy. And it occurred to me that a sustainable global economy, one that's socially, environmentally, and financially sustainable, must be comprised of a network of sustainable local economies. Rather than a global network monopolized by long-distance shipping routes supplying basic needs from faraway places, I envisioned an intricate network, a global network of small, fair trade relationships connecting local economies that are self-reliant in basic needs, which exchange excess production and unique local products for what is not available locally. This vision led me in 2001 to co-found Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, a network of over 50,000 local entrepreneurs, community leaders, and local economy funders in self-organizing communities throughout North America. Bali is connecting leaders, spreading solutions, and driving capital to build a network of local economies that serve the needs of all people while restoring our environments, our local ecosystems, and creating more joyful community life. Uh, for more on Bali, Executive Director Michelle Long will be speaking at noon today. So all this began with compassion for pigs. My decision to share my supply sources and lose my competitive edge did not come easily. I was afraid. I was afraid my sales would go down, my profits would go down. But I did not make that decision because I decided in my head that it was the right thing to do. I made the decision because I loved the pigs, because I felt it in my heart. My love for the pigs, for my community, for healthy food and family farms, for the beauty of nature were greater than my fear. So what lessons did I learn from this experience? A decentraliz the decentralization of our food and energy systems and other production of basic needs creates more owners, and broad-based ownership increases equality and strengthens our democracy, now at great risk from the concentration of wealth and power. When we increase local production, build local supply chains, distribution systems, and support our main street retailers, we shift economic power to our communities, provide more meaningful jobs, and increase community wealth. Local ownership ignites vibrant communities. When we invest 
locally, we not only receive a financial return, but also a living return, the benefit of living in a more self-reliant, happy, and healthy community. Investing locally ignites vibrant communities. When firms and other businesses grow larger and larger, they go beyond human scale and beyond humane scale and diminish community life, both in rural and urban communities. Chain stores and national brands are like invasive species, smothering indigenous local businesses. But we can reimagine growth and grow in the way that nature grows, deeper in place. Local business networks, including impact hubs, can function like healthy ecosystems, sharing, cooperating, using each other's waste, growing deeper in place to become diverse, more complex, and more adaptive to the needs of our community. Growing deeper in our places ignites vibrant communities. It is not about belongings, but our sense of belonging that brings us happiness and security. When we know who grows our food, who bakes our bread, who makes our clothes, who builds our furniture, who brews our bill, who distills our gin, we build an increase, a community and increase our happiness. When we overcome separation and reconnect producers and consumers, borrowers and lenders, work life and community life, and make decisions to maximize relationships rather than maximize profits, we build vibrant communities. Building a new economy begins in the heart of the entrepreneur and the heart of the investor and consumer as well. When we understand that life is interconnected and we are able to feel our connection to the struggling farmers, to the suffering pigs, to the polluted waterways and dying fish, when we love our places and take responsibility for them, when we open our hearts and lead with love, we build vibrant communities. The ultimate vibrant community is our earth community, the web of life that includes and supports all life. There is urgency in the work ahead to stop climate change and environmental decline before this vibrant community of life on earth is damaged beyond repair. We in the localist movement have seen what works in our communities, and we are scaling up. We are pursuing small scale on a large scale, and we hope you will join us. But strategy and tactics are of secondary importance. If we succeed in leaving a positive future for our children and for the children of all species, it will be because mankind has evolved to take our place in the vibrant community of love, not as exploiters, but as lovers. Thank you. Go ahead, gentlemen. Please go ahead. I think my, we've got one more chair coming. <laughs> Matt, Matt's next to me, Jonathan in the middle, and Ronald on the right. So I'm, I'm nowhere so far. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Thanks. Matt, I'm going to have you move over one. Thanks. <laughs> that was an example of quickly setting up chairs. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage for our closing part of this morning's session three very distinguished colleagues. Um, on my immediate left is Matt Bannock, who is the managing partner of the Omidyar Network, but also has been the co-chair of the U.S. National Advisory Board on Impact Investing. Um, next to him is Jonathan Greenblatt, a great friend and colleague who is also special assistant to the president and director of the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. And um, from the farthest away, uh, and farthest away from me, is uh, Ronald Cohen, whom I first met when I was a young leader uh, starting my own um, community investment organization. And Ronald today is the chair of the Social, in in sorry, the Social Impact Investment Task Force established by the G8 countries. So we're here actually to reflect on what's happened between last year and this year, when Matt was on stage and was talking to us about the development of this uh, task force. And so my first questions are for you. Um, 
you've had a very interesting role. You were telling us last year at this time what, what might happen in the 12 months uh, that have occurred since then. So tell us about what's evolved and what are the, what are the recommendations that have come out of the advisory task force? Yeah, so we first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. And it's, it's uh, great to share the, the stage here, however briefly, with, with Sir Ronald or with, with, with Jonathan, who've been kind of instrumental in this process. Um, but as Penelope was saying, I was here last year talking about the launch of the National Advisory Board uh, on impact investing. And our task was to work together as a community of impact investors and come up with a set of policy recommendations for government that we were hopeful would help kind of move the needle and help government become a true partner in the quest to really accelerate the growth of impact investing. And uh, I've been uh, privileged to be co-chair of the National Advisory Board with Tracy Plangian of Social Finance. Um, and I think we've made, I'm here to say, we've made tremendous progress. Um, we've launched a report. It's always good to, to come with a prop here. We've launched a report. <laughs> It's, it's a, I, I assure you, it's a fascinating read of some 51 pages, uh, chock full of fabulous recommendations about what can be done, what government can do to help us accelerate the, um, the, the sector. And their recommendations basically fall into three buckets. One is about removing regulatory barriers. Um, and here there are a whole host of things. For example, foundations currently are investing more and more in for-profit entities with a social purpose through what are called program-related investments or mission-related investments. Um, but there more, more can be done to clarify and enhance the regulations so that additional money can flow into PRIs and MRIs. And that's just one example that can be, uh, re is really important in terms of reducing regulatory barriers. The second area is about making existing programs more efficient, more effective. And here, again, there are a whole host of examples of things that we can do. Uh, one thing, one organization I'm f pretty familiar with and we work with at the Midyear Network is OPIC, um, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And OPIC has done a tremendous job in providing debt to U.S. companies who are doing fabulous work overseas. But there are also constraints within OPIC's charter. For example, they can't provide equity, which can be the most catalytic of, 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 of capital types. So in our recommendations in the report, um, we call upon greater flexibility on giving, uh, providing greater flexibility for OPIC and, uh, and, and finding other ways to make government programs more effective. And finally, there's a set of recommendations in the report about ways in which government can continue to catalyze the impact investing market. It's so interesting that people sometimes uh, shy away from government and see it as an impediment. The reality is government plays a critical role in so many industries. You know, think of energy, think of the internet, right? Great example is venture capital industry with which many of us here in, in, in the Bay Area are familiar. The venture capital industry really took off when government promulgated more inclusive recommendations around how pension funds make their investments. And again, here there are a number of uh, specific uh, recommendations we make. For example, we encourage the development of the uh, Global Development Innovation Fund, which is being pioneered by USAID and DFID in the UK. And we think there are a number of other examples of where government can really help catalyze markets. So th those are the big three, we think, are reducing the regulatory barriers, increasing the effectiveness of programs, and catalyzing more investment in impact investing. Thank you very much. Um, this is going to be tough. We're, we're limited on time, and I know I already have a million questions, and I'm sure you do too, but I'm actually going to switch order a little bit. Um, Ronald, when you listen to Matt and you think about this audience out here, you've got entrepreneurs, investors, yeah. um, a, a quite a diverse audience. Why should they care about what Matt just said? Thank you, Penelope. Uh, may, I, may I say it's just, do you mind if I stand? Just you to, may to do speak. whatever you wish, yeah. Uh, it's great to be here with you in Silicon Valley. Uh, I started out at the age of 26 as an entrepreneur and uh, a venture capitalist. Used to have a, an office in Silicon Valley. And I'd like to answer Penny's question by saying, what brought me to this area is when the British government 14 years ago asked me to look at the issue of poverty and look more entrepreneurially at how we could cope with it. And what I realized is that a social entrepreneur, somebody who wants to devote their career and their effort and their resources to helping others, can't access capital in the way that a business entrepreneur can. 
And that's what impact investment is about. Enabling social entrepreneurs, whether they're working through not-for-profits or for-profits, to raise the capital they need in order to improve the lives of others, or the environment, which improves the lives of all of us. And I guess that's the reason why all of you are here. And when you listen to what Matt was saying, what Matt is saying is there have been some evolutions in thinking which bring us to a tipping point today. And government has to push us over the tipping point. The evolution of thinking is 19th century talked about financial return. 20th century talked about risk and return. 21st century talks about risk, return, and impact. Next evolution in thinking, we've all assumed that you can't measure impact forever. But through the development of social impact bonds and in other ways, we've begun to realize that you can measure social impact and that if you set clear impact objectives and you measure their achievement, it helps you to raise your game. And if government is prepared to pay for success or if foundations, we heard Judith Rodin's very eloquent explanation of all the things, the pioneering things that Rockefeller Foundation have been doing, if foundations are prepared to step in, and pay for success, then we begin to have a world where those who achieve a social performance can get remunerated for it, and they can access capital the same way a business entrepreneur that delivers profit can. In order to make that happen, we need two big enabling moves by government, and that's what the task force report is going to be pushing when it emerges in two weeks' time on September 15th. And I want you, please, all of you, to watch out for it. And we want a clamorous response to the report. <laughs> Thank you. What the report basically will say is, beyond what I have said already, government needs to look at the fiduciary duties of trustees, of foundations, and of pension funds in the same way that ERISA legislation got money to flow into venture capital, into my first venture capital fund and others, in that same way, we want money to begin to flow from foundations and pension funds using their endowments. This involves a redefinition or a clarification of their duties, that the returns they're trying to achieve are not just financial returns, they're financial and social returns. And in my country, the Law Commission has been working on clarifying this. So I'm hopeful that the United States can lead in this area. The second area is for government to make it much easier to enter into the sort of pay-for-success arrangements that Judith was talking about this morning, whether it be for international aid, whether it be domestically, whether it be for social issues or for environmental issues, if government is prepared to sign, or if a foundation or a corporation is prepared to sign a contract that says, if you improve the dropout rate from school, if you improve the homelessness rate, if you improve the rate of recidivism, if you improve the attainment levels in underprivileged neighborhoods, then we will pay you for it. And the amount we pay you will enable your investors to get a return, but it will be a fraction of the saving and the saving itself will be a fraction of the value created for society. So, Penelope, that's what I take from what Matt Thank is you. saying. That was eloquent and brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, in a, I'm in a terrible bind. I, our clock is running down here, you know, and I have so much to say to these fellows and want them to say to us, but Jonathan, um, thinking about how this becomes real, this policy becomes real, um, uh, what, what, what's your sense of, of the climate for making these kinds of policy changes that Matt and Ron are alluding to here in the U.S. anyway? Well, um, <clears throat> so first of all, I think I would say that uh, the climate is pretty good, and I'm pretty encouraged. I think for all of you to know, you know, Washington is a long way away from the <laughs> Bay Area and from Silicon Valley. But the fact of the matter is something very significant happened with the creation of the task force that Sir Ronald chairs 
and with the establishment of the advisory board that Matt co-chairs. You had a blue chip group that came together with representation from Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation and entrepreneurs like Seth Goldman from Honest Tea and academics like Kathy Clark who was up here earlier. So you had this remarkable non-political group that came together and said, you know, what White House, government, right. this is what we need you to do in order to lead. The good news is that the president deeply believes in impact investing. He believes in social innovation more broadly. It's why he created the Office of Social Innovation, why he launched the Social Innovation Fund, why he's pioneered paper success and social impact bonds, why he's championed cross-sector leadership. And this, he believes, impact investing is part of a strategy of accelerating economic recovery and boosting job creation. So this book, this report, has some great recommendations in it, and they're all, we are already starting to see some progress. So this summer on the Hill, there was bipartisan legislation proposed in the House and the Senate to create a $300 million fund at Treasury, a pay-for-success fund, that will basically create the, um, the credit enhancements, the outcome payments, and will essentially be for the social impact bond field, what the CDFI fund was at Treasury for community development finance, or what the SBIC program has been for venture capital. So it can be tremendously powerful to unlock the kind of leverage that you see in those programs. Think 10x, think 20x on that $300 million proposal. The fact that, again, Republicans and Democrats are behind it is really good news. The second thing I would say why I'm encouraged is this summer, as Judith mentioned, we hosted a roundtable at the White House on impact investing. And we had investors, many of whom came out here from right. San Francisco, from venture capital firms, from uh, asset management firms, some foundations, who stepped forward and said, we're going to make commitments because we see impact investing not as a trade-off between you know, impact and returns, but as a way to drive alpha as a way to deploy capital, as a way to create value. They made over $1.5 billion worth of new commitments this summer. And it wasn't the fact that uh, they were Dems or Republicans. It was this is where the market is headed. So I think there are, there are very encouraging political currents, which we can look at. Right. There are very, very interesting uh, developments on the investment side, which we can look at, which give us great, great confidence that there's a lot of opportunity moving forward. It's, it's just so heartening for me to be on this stage, you know, and listen to the, the idea of these kinds of systems, solutions emerging. You know, it's really so exciting. Yeah, the other thing I would add, Penelope, is, yeah. is SOCAP has been at this now for, what, eight years? Yeah. This intersection of money, yeah. and, money and meaning. And so many of us, certainly on the stage and in the audience, are committed to using all tools we have to have a positive impact in the yeah. world. And this report and this effort with the task force this is all about marshalling that same ethos, that same energy that SOCAP has helped bring along for so many years into the public sector as well and getting government as a partner so that we can take this to the next stage. So it's completely resonant with your work here. And uh, again, I've just been delighted to serve with these two gentlemen and, and trying to push this forward a little bit. Well, um, we're going to do something amazing as a group. Uh, these fellows and I are going to actually end on time. Um, but one thing that I want to make sure that uh, I have a chance to ask one of you, so I'm going to make it Jonathan, uh, is yeah. in 30 seconds, if you were a reporter for the rest of the morning and you were going to go out with your mic and interview this audience, what would be the one question you'd want to ask them? What would be the question that I would want to you're, ask? Yeah, you're a reporter. you got a mic. you got the rest of the morning, and you've got this audience. Right. Uh, that's a hard question. Um, I think... <laughs> I guess what I would say is, what are you going to do to make an impact on these issues? Great. So are you going to write your congressman? Are you going to write your senator? Are you going to write me and tell me what are the issues that you think matter to you that you want to see the administration undertake? And so not only will I ask that question on behalf of everyone in the room, I'll give you an answer. <laughs> so my email address is innovation at who.eop.gov. Write it so down. there's the question. You should email me <laughs> with what you think the White House and the President should be doing to move this ball forward, or you should tell me what you are going to do and, to advance the recommendation. And I want you to do this. 
I really, really want us to do this because that's the power of SOCAP. And so you've had an invitation from, from Jonathan to do that and for all of these uh, people and the amazing work that this, uh, this, these committees have been doing, it's, it's our job to advocate. And so I hope you'll do that with me. Um, so let's celebrate the end of our morning session with a round of applause for these wonderful men. Thank you. Just a, just a little bit of quick information for you here. We, uh, you'll see in your program that Ed Edmo was going to do was going to tell a story right now, which we're really excited about his presence with us. But because we got a little bit of a late start today, stop talking to each other and get in here quicker, okay? <laughs> but um, anyway, we, he will be joining us at 6:10 at the closing plenary session that you don't want to miss. Our, our youngest entrepreneur, Vivian, who from Make a Stand Lemonade, will be with us, and Van Jones talking about Yes, We Code will be at 610 back in this room. We're going to start the next session, the, the parallel sessions. 100 Resilient Cities will be in this room, and you can use uh, page 32 and 33 in your program book about what's going on all over the campus. There are 10 concurrent sessions, or 12. They will start in 10 minutes, and then the next set of concurrent sessions will start at 12, just like advertised in the schedule book. So we've got some catching up to do. Uh, we'll see you at lunch. Thank you. <laughs>